I'm actually hijacking this talk to, um, to do a talk about mortgage-driven development. Has anybody heard of mortgage-driven development? Great, got some fans in the room. Well, I'm going to start with an introduction just so you, uh, the rest of you can get some context. Mortgage-driven development is basically about protect, protecting, you know, the most important thing, um, which is uh, your, your home. So we have some core principles. First of which is, maintainable code offers no job security, okay? Second one is, programming should be a solitary activity. So I remember the days when, you know, I first started programming, I could just come into work, put my earphones on, and hack away all day. Nobody bothered me, I didn't have to collaborate with anybody. And this is what we really want to get, get, uh, get things back to. So. We have a manifesto. Um, just some examples from that. Uh, so we, we've heard about new ways of developing software through by, by paying consultants and reading Gartner reports. Through this, we have been told to value in individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Blah, 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 blah. That is, while the items on the left sound nice in theory, we're an enterprise company and there's no way we're letting go of the items on the right. So, let's have a look at some examples. These people here. Look at them. You see any work getting done there? Look at them all, collaborating away, chit-chatting. That's not mortgage-driven, okay? Now we're talking. <laughs> yeah? This guy's in the zone, right? He's even got, he's got two computers so he can, you know, keep, keep working all the time. He's got his earphones on. He's in a nice, quiet cubicle so it's hard for him to be interrupted. So this is the kind of thing we're talking about. So let's go back to those principles, right? Maintainable code offers no job security. Okay, so what does that imply? It means I want to try, whenever I'm writing code, I want to try and make that code as mysterious and hard to understand as possible. Right? Because if this code could be read and understood and, and maintained, by, maintained easily, that means it could be maintained by anybody, not just me. Right? And that's a worry. Equally, if I really want to be left alone at work and, and uh, achieve this goal of making my programming solitary activity, I need to try and make, make it as awkward and unpleasant as I can get away with to work with me, right? If I, if I make it too unpleasant, I might get fired. And then I won't be able to pay the mortgage. So, obviously be careful with that one. So with that in mind, who here has heard of the uh, behavior-driven development tool, Cucumber? Okay, I've got an important message for you about Cucumber. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> okay, and bear with me, right? I'm going to explain to you why. Let's have a look at why Cucumber is such a threat. Let's think about what the, the Cucumber experts like to talk about. So, Cucumber promotes collaboration between stakeholders and developers. How's this going to help us to, to be left alone and, and program in peace? It promotes transparency of how the system actually behaves, which is really the last thing we need, right, if we want to try and hold on to all that uh, information that we have in our private ivory tower about what the system does. Okay? If there's transparency out there, that means anybody could work on this system. That's a really bad thing. <sighs> Look at this. Okay, aims to develop a shared understanding or ubiquitous language in the within the team. Have you ever heard? What a load of nonsense. Eh? Honestly. Okay, so what we're going to do about this is mortgage-driven developers. I've got a couple of suggestions. Well, I, I really I've got one core practice. And that practice is called refactoring. <laughs> okay. 
So, how does refactoring work? I didn't invent refactoring, okay? Refactoring was first introduced at the Waterfall 2006 conference by Jason Gorman. And refactoring is the process of taking a well-designed piece of code and, through a series of small reversible changes, making it completely unmaintainable by anyone except yourself. That sounds pretty mortgage-driven, doesn't it? So how do we do refactoring? What are we going to do? Well, let's take an example of a best practice cucumber test. What can we do to this to make this more awkward to deal with, harder to understand? Let's have a look. So this feature here is describing um, the process of signing up for an account. And you can see there's a bit of documentation at the top that just sort of outlines um, the steps that happen. And, and then we've got these three scenarios that are actually describing in detail what, what, the way those steps work. So the first thing, really, that we can very easily do is uh, we can apply the refactoring of remove spurious documentation. Okay? We don't need that bit up there. All it's doing is making this test easier to understand. So let's get rid of that. What we could even do is add in some sort of trite thing like as a uh, user who wants to sign up, I want to be able to sign up. Yeah, Do something like that. Just, just a bit of clutter in there just to really uh, confuse people. Okay, then the next thing we could do is we could take those three scenarios, which are acting as three separate indicators, giving three separate warnings about uh, which bits of behavior are actually functioning in the system, and we could just smack them all together. So this refactoring is called conflate scenarios. There we go. Okay, and you can Im immediately see that this, this test is getting a lot harder to read. And what's more, it's actually delivering less value now because there's only one indicator that's going to fail if any one of those three things are wrong. In fact, um, if an early part of the scenario fails, we don't even know whether the rest of it's failing or not. So, extremely mortgage-driven. Now, now we come to my favourite refactoring. Does anybody know what incidental detail is? Well, clues in the name, incidental, right? It's pointless. So this is a really good way to confuse your reader. So let's have a look at this. What could we do here to just uh, make it a little bit more confusing? Let's just flesh out the process of filling in uh, the, the, the... Oh, sorry, navigating to the sign-up form. So rather than saying, follow the sign-up link, let's, let's actually put the detail in about... Uh, which links we should, we should click. And uh, as well as so making this scenario start to become a little bit more, more hard to read, it's also making it more brittle, right? Because we're coupling it to the precise copy on the page. So this test is more likely to fail if uh, a designer wants to change the copy, um, even though the behavior is still functioning, which obviously gives us uh, a really easy way to look good in front of our boss, right? Because the build breaks, all we have to go in is do is go in and change the copy, fix the build, we look like a hero. Let's, uh, let's add a bit more incidental detail now. Let's, uh, let's expand out the, the whole process of uh, filling in the form. Um, and actually some of those fields in that form aren't mandatory, but it doesn't matter. Let's fill them in anyway, right? So this is looking a lot better now. Let's keep going with this. I'm really enjoying this. So. Just keep expanding it out. Uh, oh, it's gone off the bottom of the page. Goodness me. Yes. Okay. So we've fully refactored that original feature. I don't know if you can remember what it looked like in the first place. I certainly can't, and I don't care to either. This is the kind of thing you need to be thinking of. This is what you need to have in mind when you're writing your cucumber scenarios. Lots of incidental detail. Really just try and upset your reader as much as possible. Excellent. So let's just review um, these 
what mortgage-driven development gives us. So we've got these two uh, refactorings, insert incidental detail and conflate scenarios. And what these give us are, so the effects these give us are really uh, brittle tests, okay, so we can look like a hero in front of our boss by fixing them very easily. Reader confusion, because they don't really know what they're, what they're looking at now because there's all this noise about detail. Um, and frankly, reader boredom. You know, if you're trying to show this to a, a, a non-technical person on your team, a, a business analyst or something, and get them get their feedback uh, about whether this is the behaviour that they want, they're not really going to stick with you for very long because there's too it's it, it, it feels too technical to them. And of course, all of this helps us to achieve the end goal of job security, right? If nobody else is tinkering around in these cucumber tests, that means that we're the people that get to do it. No one's going to threaten that. So, best practices for mortgage-driven development. Include as much irrelevant detail in your features as you possibly can, which keeps them hard and boring to read and nice and brittle. See if you can sprinkle some technical details in there as well, like CSS or HTML if you can. Um, I've even seen some really, really mortgage-driven features where they actually had Ruby code in the feature that was being evalved. Uh, in the step definition, so that's a great way of, you know, making these features feel unapproachable to, um, to non-technical people on your team. Okay. So, actually, uh, I'm going to take my mortgage-driven development hat off now. I'm, I'm actually author of a book about cucumber, and I care passionately about this stuff, about making Cucumber work as a tool to bridge the gap between uh, us technologists and the non-technical people on the team. I think actually that if you aren't making an effort to do that, uh, you're using the wrong tool if you're using Cucumber. You really should be just using a, a more straightforward test runner like uh, whatever your X unit tool is in your language because Cucumber does add extra maintenance cost, it adds this extra layer of complexity which is translation between the English and the, the, the code that's going to be run underneath. And the value that you get from that is that you have this uh, document that you can show to people on your team who can't read code that reflects the behaviour of the system. And if you're on the right kind of a team that can be really, really valuable. Lots of teams have got one or two people on them who would love to be able to read the code because they're really interested in the detail of the edge cases that the system does and doesn't support, but they can't read code. And Cucumber helps to give you a place to, to meet with those people and discuss the ins and outs of what that behavior should be. So I think this is really important. And I see this such a lot that features are written by technical people uh, without getting the feedback from, uh, from the non-technical people. So, the question I want to ask you really is, is why are you writing these? Who, who is using Cucumber day to day? Why, why are you writing features? Why are you using Cucumber? So can someone, someone give me an answer. Hmm? Use your mic. It's reverse Q&A. Uh, 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 Use your mic if you want to answer. Is that rhetorical? Uh, no, it wasn't entirely rhetorical. I quite like to hear what people have got. But, I don't uh, use it, so... Uh, we're using Cucumber so we can tell what our test did. Tell what your tests did? Yeah. I can't see. Where's the... There, hi. I'd love to have non-technical people read it someday, but we're not there yet. The non-technical people? Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I think that's a great goal. It's yeah. just been... Um, it's, it's, it's taking a while to reach it. But at least it helps us. It helps us. It gives us at least something we can look at at a glance. Yeah. And say like, oh, okay, well, I know where inside in the test failed. Yeah. Rather than like, what is that DOM element again? Where yeah. is it? Like, yeah. Yeah. So even if it's not necessarily speaking to a, 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 an individual on the team who's non-technical, it's kind of speaking to the part of your brain that's non-technical and helping you to think in terms of just the features in the system rather than the detail about how that's implemented. But there is, uh, there's another aspect to this, which I think Liz talked about probably in her keynote yesterday, I didn't see it, which is actually the act of, of writing features, if you can do it collaboratively, it can help you to flush out the behavior that you want. 
So this is, you know, you all know probably this uh, Standish group thing about 66, is it? Percent, 64% of features in software systems are rarely or never used. Right? So that blue circle is all of the stuff that the business people think they need and uh, that bit in the middle is all you actually need. That's the bit that the, your users are, um, are actually going to enjoy and benefit from. And so, and in fact, probably there's something even smaller than that that would give you some value right now. And the skill of, uh, I think, of software project management is trying to find what's that next thing, what's that bullseye that you can aim towards right now. And I think the whole team needs to be involved in this. And if you can be... Uh, working together to talk about the features that you're building before you start building them, that can really help you to have those conversations to get uh, the business side and the development side on the same page. So, kind of a similar question to the one I asked before, but who are you writing these features for? Are you writing them for yourselves and for the development team as tests? Or are you trying to write them, are you thinking about your reader as being the non-technical people on your team. I mean, when, when I write Cucumber Features myself, what I'm trying to do is run around this loop of, you know, there's an idea about something that we want to build, and I'm going to try and nail down, as we're discussing it, I'm going to try and nail down the things that we've got agreement about in a feature before I go ahead and write any code. So the feature becomes the place where I kind of, I minute the conversation that I have with my stakeholder. And then we can go on and build some code, and when we look at the code, we get even more ideas. But if I'm working with Cucumber well, I can actually use it to iterate in a very, very cheap fashion, because we can start to visualize what the system's going to be before we've built it. We can use other tools for that, like wireframes and mock-ups, but Cucumber really helps go on a, on a direction about behavior and helps you to, to visualize what the system's going to look like. So I think the challenge I want to put to you is if you're using Cucumber, think about are you writing tests or are you writing documentation that describes what the system does? Are you writing a specification document for the system? Because if you can think about it like a specification document, it's much more likely to continue to work for those non-technical people on your team. Inevitably, because most of the time the features are being touched by technical people, they're the people with access to Git and Subversion who are, who are running them day to day, those people want them as tests and they're going to get dragged down towards the sort of test end of the spectrum. So try and keep thinking about them as documentation and tr make that your goal. Because actually that's the way to make them maintainable too. Um, there's a little point I want to make here about, which is a sort of uh, admission of guilt on the part of the Cucumber team, which is that we, uh, we used to ship Cucumber, at least for Ruby on Rails, the Ruby on Rails plugin for Cucumber, with this file, which actually gave you these very high, uh, low level steps, which, um, you know, did things like clicking buttons and filling in fields. And worse than that, this file actually came with this big hairy warning at the top telling you not to touch it. And it's funny because I was talking to somebody about this file uh, and we both said that one of the first things we did when we started a new Rails project was we deleted it. But of course, because I know Aslak, um, I know he wrote that message, I've got my own opinions. I didn't really heed it very much, but I expect lots of people took it at its word and really thought, you know, this is the right way. This is the way I should be writing my cucumber tests. It's gone now. So, it's really about thinking about levels of abstraction. And 
There, there are two names, uh, I don't know whether they're, they're precisely the correct words to use, but they're the words that are used anyway in the commu cucumber community to describe the sort of two ends of the spectrum of the, the way that you could write a cucumber test. So at the higher level of abstraction, if you like, we have what's called a declarative style, and at a lower level we have what's called the imperative style. So declarative style, we just say, I fill out the form with valid details, imperative style, we ramble on about the details of exactly how that's going to happen. Now, I'm not saying that this is black and white, that this is good and this is evil. Not quite. Um, but I have obviously spent quite a bit of time ridiculing this way of doing it. And, and really the reason why is... Um, that my experience is that when you, when you work like this with Cucumber, you, you really get a much, much less benefit in lots of ways, and you end up with these brittle tests that are quite annoying. And that's not Cucumber's fault, that's actually your fault, because that's the way that you're writing the tests. And you also don't get the benefit of being able to include um, the, the wider members of your team in, in discussions about the features and what they should say. What's more, when we talk about a ubiquitous language, right, when we think about trying to learn a way of a, a, a language for discussing our project, when we use the imperative style, the language that we use in the features could be applicable to any system on the planet because all of the domain terminology is, the, is in the domain of user interfaces. Fill in this, click this. When we use a declarative style, we force ourselves to give names to these concepts for these things that we're doing. And if we can do that uh, in a collaborative session with a stakeholder, they can give us a name that comes from the business rather than us making up a technical name. And that name can then feed its way all the way down into the code, into the classes, the database tables that we use to represent that thing. You can't, so I'm selling the declarative style. You can take it too far. <laughs> and the point I'm making here really is, right, so you could have just this one cucumber scenario for your whole system. But that would imply a huge amount of trust in the person who has implemented the assertion step at the bottom. Then it should work perfectly. That person needs to have written a lot of assertions in that step definition that, that contain a lot of knowledge about what exactly is meant by perfect behavior of the system. And this is the danger with the declarative style is that we push down too much detail and we're not actually being honest enough about what we're doing. So that's the place to be cautious with this. That's the place to pull back. Make sure that you're exposing enough detail that stakeholders feel trust in, in what they're reading and you're not glossing over too much detail. So the point I was making about domain language earlier, there's a great blog post by Dan North uh, who kind of came up with a lot of the ideas that are behind Cucumber. Uh, that's on his blog. It's, I guess, a couple of years old now, but it's worth Googling and having a read if you're interested in this subject. And uh, so, so what about solutions? Well, the main thing is to get feedback. I'm putting it to you that you want to be trying to use these cucumber tests as uh, a, a communication point, a focal point in your communication with the, with the business-facing side of the team. So get their feedback. Even if it feels a bit embarrassing, the, the way I'd, I started out doing this is I'd have a session, um, you know, like a story writing session with, with a stakeholder, and we'd be going through the acceptance criteria for a new user story. And the first thing I'd do when I'd go back to my desk and I'd sit down and scribble out the feature that described what we'd just been discussing, I'd just copy and paste it into an email, and I'd say, based on the conversation we just had, here's what I'm about to build just start to get their feedback. And it was amazing, you know, even the, uh, the, the designer who was in that session who was, uh, you know, he, he, his technical level stops at Photoshop, he was actually giving me feedback and telling me about scenarios that I'd missed. 
This is a tool uh, for getting feedback, which I'm working on. Um, it's, it's kind of a gap, I think, at the moment with Cucumber. It's a failing of Cucumber. That it's a very technical tool. You run it at the command line. Yeah, it looks pretty, and you can generate HTML reports um, that show you which features have passed and failed. But there's actually no way for um, you know, the business analyst, the person on the team, to get their hands on the features if they want to. So that's why I built Relish. You can push your features there, renders them up as a nice website with every scenario has got its own URL, every feature has got its own URL. They look pretty. There's a full text search. Um, there's lots more features coming, which, you know, if you're, if you're interested and you start using it, I'd love to hear what you'd like. Um, but it's already sort of solving the, the main problem for me, which is putting those features in the hands of the non-technical people on the team, because they're the people who really should be t trying to take ownership of them, really. So, I'm doing good for time. Um, I want to conclude by just, just making some, reviewing some points, really. Uh, so try, try and think about, when you're writing Cucumber tests, tr try and think about them as documentation. Try and write documentation for, the, try and write a specification for the system. And the tests become a sort of side effect of that. If you have a go at this, uh, try and have a session for a new story, sitting down together with a domain expert to write the scenario. You'll be surprised at how painful it is at first, at how many arguments will happen in that session uh, about which words you should use and how you should describe something. But I think the, the interesting thing about those arguments is that what they're surfacing are misunderstandings that would have happened further on in the project. So. If two people have got a different mental model of what this piece of software should look like, that's what is getting surfaced by that argument that happens when you try to actually describe it together in plain English. And much better, in my opinion, to surface that misunderstanding now, before you start writing the code, than further down the line. And the thing is, it gets easier and easier. So the more practice you have at working together with stakeholders to write these scenarios, the more your common language evolves, and the closer your mental models become aligned about what the project is, and this gets easier and easier to do. Equally, um, as I said, you know, uh, the advantage of a, a very imperative style is that you can actually write a lot of features with very few step definitions. If you've got these generic step definitions about clicking buttons and filling in uh, fields and forms, you can kind of do anything with that. You just end up with very hard to, hard to read features. So that means that you're pu pushing more complexity down into your step definitions, which means that uh, there's more complexity in that test code. You need to pair it with programmers to make sure that test code is well factored, uh, well engineered, just like the rest of the system. And watch out for those incidental details, because they're really the, the sort of, that's where the rot starts. Don't put any detail in a scenario that isn't relevant. Don't put anything in there that, that isn't important to, to, to what's actually being tested, because otherwise it's just a distraction. It confuses the reader. Okay, that's, uh, that's, that's me. There's some references there which will be on the slides, um, which will be on the website, I guess. So I've got about five minutes for questions. Anyone got any questions? There's one over there. Who's got the mic? Has everyone got their own mic? Yeah. That's amazing. Electronic, yeah. <laughs> what does it say? Electric engineering. <laughs> right. Very good at reading. Anyway, you've got a question. Let's, uh, let's Actually, put the attention on you rather than me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now, I was really interested in this release uh, tool. I mean, I would like to ask how similar or different is to fitness, and if you can run the Cucumber test as unit test with Bish. Oh, sorry. So t two questions there, because you said how similar is, so you're interested in Relish, and how similar is it to fitness, and what was the second thing? If you can run the test uh, as unit test, like you can do with the, with the fit test. Right. So no. The, the, uh, right now, Relish is completely read-only. You certainly can't run tests. Um, you can't, what, the, the, the next thing I'd really like to add is the ability for people to not necessarily write uh, entire features, but at least comment on them and give feedback about, the, about them so they sort of 
uh, make notes about changes they'd like to see, but you can't run them, no. Um, I mean, the infrastructure for doing that would be really complicated. Redis is on the cloud, so you push your features out to that and they're, and they're, and they're there with you know, security around them for private projects. But um, it, doesn't, it doesn't work the same way as fitness, where you'd have to actually uh, have a running instance of fitness in-house for your project. So, um, so, so when do, do you get this kind of test format? I mean, you, you develop your tests using, using QCamera, you run them, and then afterwards you generate this other format so you can see them in, in release or yeah yeah so you so basically just publish it it's like so it's publishing the specification document okay. somewhere yeah. so it's like you generate this kind of report or yeah. for, for yeah. bs yeah. or something okay yeah thank you yeah that's the way to think about it yeah okay thank you any more questions yeah uh, we used relish for uh, pushing all features online uh, but having discussed with the team, uh, they said that this is not safe to, you know, uh, push all our uh, data uh, online yeah. uh, publicly. So, is it possible to uh, 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 get private some feature, like make some features private, and uh, we won't mind uh, all the common features become public, but we need some data to be secure, like yes. some features. So you can you can make your project private, the same way as you can with GitHub. Um, it's uh, right now you can't do it through the web interface. You have to do it through the command line interface when you're pushing. Uh, the same way as when you push. So you call relish project private. So is, there, is, is it a free or is it a? Well, the, that's Price the idea. Plan. So, so uh, right now it's in beta. Everything's free. Um, but ultimately, uh, yes, you will be charged a small monthly subscription for private projects. So I can sort of sustain the project basically. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah, question? Um, regarding Relish, is there any, um, some sort of like SVN hook that you can use so that every time, because we write our feature file in SpecFlow yeah. and we commit that into SVN. Yeah. So yeah. is there some sort of hook that it will fetch it so that we don't have to maintain both sides? Yeah, you're not the first person to ask me that. There isn't yet, no. Uh, people would also like a GitHub hook. A lot of people are pushing to GitHub and um, GitHub has got post commit hooks that you can run. Um, but no, it's it, right now I'm uh, working on uh, the sort of usability stuff with a, uh, a friend of mine. So that's what we're focused on right now. Um, but that's definitely... It's something to put in the, in the, there's a user voice backlog. If you see the little feedback button on the left hand side, that'd be really nice to have uh, for subversion as well. Any more questions? Right, I guess that's, that's a wrap then. Thank you very much. That was great. It was good timing. Right? Yeah. <laughs> that was awesome. Thanks. We've got a break now. Uh, come back here for Lightning Talks. Uh, 3.50 is the official start time. If you're a Lightning Talks speaker, make sure that you're here and sitting in the front row.